I got to get it back up. Hey, Nathan, bring down one and bring up two. No, sorry, opposite, bring two down. So we are good to start, right? All right, it's a pleasure to welcome our uh, visitor today, uh, Professor Eugene Demler, longtime friend. Uh, Eugene uh, got his PhD from Stanford, then he moved to Harvard, uh, went through all the ranks, becoming a full professor, and eventually he moved to ETH in Switzerland. And he uh, also got this Humboldt Award and worked as a distinguished scholar in uh, Max Planck Institute in Garching. Uh, later, actually, two years ago, he got this uh, very prestigious Hamburg Award in uh, uh, theoretical physics. But more important than all these uh, awards, recognition, and honors, uh, Eugene uh, did really seminal contribution and provide, provided leadership for, in theoretical uh, quantum physics. So please join me in welcoming Eugene today. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Vlad. Uh, thank you for the invitation uh, and for this very kind introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. So one quick question, what should I use as a pointer? This seems to be somewhat shortened uh, in prior use. Oops. Oh, thank you. It's perfect. You also could make it as feature as well. I see, okay. And that's perfect. Uh, no, oh, no, it's, it's okay. Quite, uh, let me build it here. Wow, <laughs> prepared for all contingencies. Thank you a lot. Okay. So this is what it says. Mm -hmm. uh, no, start. So I, I probably don't need this. No. no. Okay, perfect. Okay, and then the laser pointer. Yes. Oops, sorry. <laughs> Okay. Oh. Uh, okay. Great. Uh, let's uh, get going. Uh, so I'll tell you about uh, our work, and actually appreciate uh, the opportunity to talk about a relatively new direction uh, in the research program of my group, uh, which is uh, sort of focusing on photonics aspects. So many things uh, that I am presenting today are fairly recent. Uh, and uh, we're continuing to think about them. So feedback, comments, suggestions, criticism will be greatly appreciated. I want to begin by uh, giving credit to people who did most of uh, the work. Uh, so this is John, uh, who uh, was a postdoc uh, back at Harvard uh, and is currently a postdoc at UCLA. Pavel uh, is a grad student in uh, group uh, at Harvard uh, and uh, Ilya, uh, is, uh, has been a, a PhD postdoc at Harvard and now started a faculty job in Wisconsin. So uh, just to orient uh, people, I'll be, when I talk about photons, uh, there will be kind of two frequency and energy ranges uh, that we will be discussing. Uh, I will uh, sp spend a, kind of the beginning of my talk, uh, will focus, and when I talk about photons as a platform, I'll talk about terahertz photons uh, and uh, like in terms of energy scales for people uh, who are uh, more on the condensed matter side, so we talk about uh, Miller electron volts. And the reason why uh, this is very interesting for people coming from um, condensed matter background is that this is a frequency range where a lot of collective excitations uh, in interacting systems uh, exist, so we can uh, starts with very simple phonon modes, but it's also uh, sort of the frequency uh, of, like say, quasi-particle excitations, uh, frequency of Josephson plasmons. So defining uh, sort of uh, characteristic defining excitations of uh, superconducting state. 
Super, uh, and then uh, when we talk about what and as a probe, I'll focus uh, on uh, gigahertz uh, frequencies. Uh, and in this case, uh, it is mostly a reflection of the experimental toolbox, uh, uh, which uh, we have now. And I'll try to argue that uh, uh, sort of local probes, uh, such as NV centers, provide a very powerful uh, tool to get new uh, insight uh, into like many body systems. And of course, uh, kind of, uh, the dream uh, uh, of the theories would be to push, uh, to extend this range uh, that like as we can use similar techniques to go from gigahertz to terahertz. Uh, and that's something I'll be happy to discuss uh, offline. Okay, so uh, this is the outline of my talk. I'll try to give you a, a kind of a summary of different research direction that we'll be interested in. So when we talk about photons uh, as a platform, uh, I'll, uh, like the central theme around what I'll be presenting will be cavity uh, QED. And uh, uh, then uh, I'll try to uh, discuss different aspects. One is, okay, well, if uh, we want to get interesting many body physics with photons, we have to make them strongly interacting. And I'll suggest one specific example of cavity QED, which, uh, I think uh, is very promising and uh, just uh, uses tools which are available in uh, many labs. Uh, and this is uh, like, uh, I say, materials with hyperbolic phone and polarity on something as simple as HBN and then coupled uh, to matter, which could be an uh, electron gas. Uh, then uh, there will be uh, a question, okay, but if we have strong uh, uh, light fields interacting very strongly with matter excitations, how do we analyze them? It's actually an interesting theoretical challenge. So I'll uh, give you uh, a review of some of the theoretical tools uh, that we have developed for the systems. Uh, and then there will be uh, a discussion of, okay, uh, now that we have uh, sort of control uh, over photons, but they uh, can also be uh, kind of combined with matter degrees of freedom to control many body states. In particular, I'll discuss uh, how we can use uh, cavities and potentially uh, uh, terahertz uh, metamaterials to control many body states of matter. Then in the second uh, part of the talk, I'll discuss how we can use uh, photon, uh, how we can use uh, uh, kind of local uh, uh, like single spin qubits such as NV centers uh, to probe interesting many body states. And I'll uh, focus on two examples, superconductors uh, and uh, magnons. And you'll see that there are uh, interesting uh, surprises in both cases. Okay, so let's start uh, by uh, discussing uh, cavity QED and kind of the idea behind uh, what I'm uh, presenting is we want to make photons very nonlinear so that we can get interesting many body physics. But as you know, Maxwell equations are linear. So the only way how photons can become nonlinear is when they hybridize uh, uh, with matter. And therefore, strong nonlinearity means that we should have strong hybridization between light and matter uh, degrees of freedom. So the first uh, uh, question that I'll discuss is, well, how do we uh, reach a strong light matter coupling? So uh, think, uh, let me give you, again, for non-experts, let me give a kind of a general idea. So when we say strong coupling, uh, what do we mean? Consider like very toy uh, model, like we just have one cavity mode uh, and uh, uh, this cavity mode uh, sort of is coupled uh, uh, in the usual way uh, to a particle, it's a single particle, uh, uh, which say uh, is in some potential, it can be double well, that's what we'll be looking at, or just even simple harmonic oscillator. And we can define this uh, uh, coupling strength uh, between uh, uh, the cavity mode, right, which is expressed in terms of the mode amplitude, uh, and uh, uh, the uh, can depends again okay, just uh, also obviously charge and also uh, uh, what uh, enters turns out in, it has to involve mass and uh, and the frequency uh, uh, of the photons. But uh, the uh, kind of real distinction uh, between uh, of sort of different parameter regimes is how this coupling strength, right, which is proportional to the charge and uh, so to the amplitude of the cavity mode at the position of the particle, how does this coupling mode uh, compare to the original photon frequencies? And uh, uh, it, there's a very amusing language that has developed uh, in this field. So 
uh, when this coupling, like traditionally, this parameter would be much less than one if we just take plain vanilla you know, uh, atom coupled uh, to uh, an optical light. Uh, and people have been pushing to how to increase this interaction. And uh, you have this hierarchy that when it's less than 0.1, uh, it's ultra strong. And uh, actually, when it's greater than one, it's extremely strong. I don't know, I guess it's really just a historical accident uh, why people chose uh, these notations. Huh? Okay, that's another perspective. So, and people have been discussing uh, various possibilities uh, 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 how to achieve uh, this uh, strong uh, coupling, straight light uh, meta coupling. Uh, let me just focus on uh, the uh, kind of what I think is uh, in very promising direction. And this is work that we have done with Yuta Ashida from the University of Tokyo and my colleague Atach uh, Imamoglu. So let me start again for people uh, who are maybe not from uh, the optics community uh, uh, with some simple uh, reminder of uh, the simplest type of light matter coupling. Imagine that we have an, uh, a collective mode uh, which has dipolar moments in uh, IR phonon. So if we look at the dispersion of this IR phonon, let's say this would be uh, some uh, uh, let's say we can even neglect uh, 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 like momentum dependence. And then we have light, right? Okay, but because there is dipolar moment uh, uh, of light, uh, uh, sorry, light, uh, dipolar moment of matter, then it will hybridize with light. And this uh, uh, leads to the formation of what's called lower uh, polariton and upper polariton. And in between there is a uh, restraline band. Uh, but, and uh, like the formation uh, of these uh, polaritons is an indication of light matter coupling, right? So like here, like eigenmodes, they're a hybrid of the original phonon uh, and uh, light-like excitation. But the problem usually is uh, that speed of light is very high. And that's why if we take some terahertz frequency and sort of divide by the speed of light, we find that actually the range of moment over which light couples to matter is very limited. And to get any appreciable effect on, of uh, light uh, on uh, kind of matter to get many body states, what we know from the BCS theory of superconductivity, you really need uh, phonon excitations, some kind of bosonic excitations over a large uh, momentum range of the order of twice k Fermi. So therefore, uh, what we want to do is we want to expand uh, the range of momenta uh, over which uh, uh, light uh, hybridizes with matter. Okay, uh, so, and in this uh, respect, actually, what uh, seems very promising is the idea of hyperbolic uh, phonon polariton. So what it means for, uh, like, uh, just in the simple uh, uh, language, consider an anisotropic material, say, layered material, uh, then uh, the frequency of IR active phonons out of plane and in plane are different. And then you will not be surprised to find the electric constant for different light polarization uh, to have opposite sign. Then if we think about this kind of light meta hybrid, essentially those light uh, meta polaritons, they uh, uh, have this dispersion, but notice uh, that uh, for different components of momentum, uh, we have different components uh, of the dielectric tensor. And now, uh, what we can have is uh, that we can have fairly appreciable uh, Q, right? And uh, in such a way that both momenta are real, uh, but together we, what we still uh, have low frequency mode just because the electric constants have different signs, right? So instead of like simple parabolas uh, for lines of constant energy, we actually get a uh, hyperbolic sense. And indeed, uh, what you can do, you can take uh, like the simple uh, HBN and uh, try to work out collective uh, excitations, this phone and polaritons, and you find that there are modes, okay, what's shown, uh, which exist in this case, this is near like this first kind of type one uh, hyperbolic uh, material that over an extended range uh, of momenta, the frequency is just very close uh, to the frequency uh, of the original uh, phonon. And uh, also we can, if we look at the profile of this mode, let's say one of the modes, see that the phonon component of course is only within the material, but it has electric field component, which extends uh, fairly uh, uh, far uh, outside of the material, which means that if we introduce some, let's say any kind of uh, uh, electronic degree of freedom, like uh, 
uh, let's say graphene, then it will be able uh, to couple to this phone and polaritons. But and now uh, you can see that we can cover a much uh, larger range uh, of momenta where uh, this uh, kind of our eigenmodes, they are combination of uh, phonons in HBN and electric field, uh, evanescent electric field uh, outside of uh, the sample. So, uh, okay, and then uh, like, do we, can we demonstrate uh, that we can indeed use uh, the system to achieve strong light metacoupling? So we looked at a fairly uh, simple example, but uh, hopefully uh, it, it's also reasonably simple to realize in experiments. Uh, consider two HBNs uh, and uh, uh, two DAG in between, which can be, for example, a two-layer graphene. Uh, and uh, now, uh, if we apply magnetic field, we get a very natural excitation uh, for meta degrees of freedom. These are cyclotron resonances, uh, and their uh, frequency is tunable with the magnetic field. And now the question that we ask is uh, how do uh, how does uh, this method degree of freedom, which is a cyclotron mode, hybridize uh, with this hyperbolic uh, phonon polaritons? Okay, uh, just a few words about uh, the Hamiltonian. So in this case, uh, like so what we have uh, are the modes, right, this uh, phonon polariton modes, which we discussed before. We have gauge field uh, coupled uh, to the electron and it involves a static magnetic field uh, and it also involves uh, vector potential arising from phonon polaritons, right? As they vibrate inside the medium, they give rise inside HB, and they also give rise to this fluctuating electric field outside, which couples uh, to electrons. So, uh, okay. Uh, in order to solve uh, this problem, you can just uh, I'll not go through the details. It turns out to uh, be useful to uh, use a technical uh, trick, which is called the low points transformation. Very familiar from for people in condensed matter systems uh, where you have an impurity, say, interact, like, or like say an electron interacting with a phonon bath. So you go to the, uh, to the frame uh, of, uh, the, uh, of electron and you get an effective potential uh, uh, just in terms of uh, the phonon degrees of freedom. So the same we can do here. We can borrow this uh, sort of uh, polaronic uh, approach from condensed matter physics and in uh, the original problem, we have cyclotron motion uh, and phonons, but now we can get an effective uh, model just in terms of phonon polaritons, but the price that we pay is that before we integrated out uh, the uh, photon, we uh, sort of have non-interacting phonon polaritons, now we generate uh, interactions. Anyway, so uh, when uh, the uh, dust settles, let me just show you spectral function, right? So basically, uh, it's like a uh, horizontal axis is magnetic field, which tunes cyclotron frequency. So it's spectral function of electron, right? Something that uh, one would use uh, with, you know, kind of the usual, uh, say, uh, micro, uh, say, some kind of optical absorption uh, of electrons. Uh, and uh, so uh, when uh, the cyclotron frequency is finely tuned uh, from this phon uh, photons, uh, phonon polaritons, uh, we see linear, dis uh, kind of linear dispersion, uh, not dispersion, linear increase uh, of, uh, the, uh, uh, of the response function, which just means that we are seeing a bare cyclotron. But then when the cyclo cyclotron mode approaches uh, the uh, frequency of phonon polaritons, we see obvious level splitting, which tells us about hybridization between the cyclotron frequency uh, with uh, uh, with phonon polaritons. And uh, notice uh, that for this splitting to be appreciable, we have to take uh, thin layers uh, of uh, HBN. So this really just has to do with the nature of uh, the modes uh, of phonon polaritons. If we want to have a kind of bigger component outside of HBN, uh, it, we, uh, it's better uh, to take uh, uh, actually thinner uh, HBN uh, slabs. Okay, uh, then uh, oh, it does, now we can also decide what type of strong coupling do we want, because if we take a large piece of, let's say, HBN and TUDAG, we have many modes, and though we, uh, uh, even though we have a strong coupling, but it's basically in some sense, the cyclotron mode really sort of hybridizes with the continuum, it's hard to distinguish individual modes, but if we take smaller sample, uh, then we see distinct modes uh, which hybridize with the cyclotron. But the bottom line is uh, that if we compute uh, the uh, interaction strength, the mixing between uh, cyclotron uh, excitation uh, and these phonon polaritons, we find that we can achieve uh, like this uh, 
uh, very strong coupling where uh, uh, a coupling is of the order of twice uh, the frequency of uh, the original uh, phonon polarity. Okay, so uh, so we have uh, kind of ways to get uh, to achieve strong couple, uh, strong light matter coupling, but the uh, like from the theory uh, point of view, uh, there are very interesting questions that arise. How do we actually even solve uh, these problems of strong coupling QED? So let me now discuss uh, like a more general setting. Imagine, but I. Uh, for the time being, I still consider just one particle, which can be a particle in a double well, but now it's coupled uh, to a continuum uh, of uh, electromagnetic, like of cavity modes of some kind, right? And uh, we still, so we have the usual kind of transverse coupling, uh, gauge coupling uh, of the field uh, to kinetic energy uh, of the particle. And uh, like later on, just to illustrate uh, the point, I'll uh, use uh, the following uh, system. Let's say, imagine we just have an uh, array of cavities, uh, and then they sort of uh, different cavity modes can hybridize with each other, which will give us a continuum of uh, cavity modes. And then next to it, we put a particle in the double well potential, so which we can uh, uh, schematically present uh, with this potential. And what you find if you look at uh, sort of uh, uh, earlier theoretical uh, papers is uh, that there are, uh, one often does a not fully controlled approximation uh, for, which is just sort of limitation uh, of the kind of uh, theoretical toolbox which people have because uh, they would sort of truncate the number of photons that they take into consideration. Uh, but that, of course, is very dangerous because if we have strong light matter coupling, then a moving particle or just even moving a sense of quantum motion can generate many photons. So truncating the Hilbert space is actually very dangerous. Another common approximation is to begin with to, let's say, limit uh, the state of the system uh, of, of the matter degree of freedom to just two levels and then uh, uh, say that, well, OK, even as we increase light matter interaction, we can still focus just on these two levels. Uh, so you'll see this is also very dangerous. And finally, there is the uh, A squared term, uh, I'll uh, point it out later, which people uh, often debate about uh, that. Uh, that it, we know that it's important and strong coupling, but what the effect uh, is going to be. OK, so let me, uh, again, uh, just give you a brief idea uh, of the uh, theoretical tool that we uh, have been thinking about. So uh, first of all, let us just write explicitly uh, uh, all the terms which describe quadratic, which correspond to quadratic operators from the point of view of cavity modes. And now this includes the A squared term, right, because it's also quadratic. And then we also have coupling uh, between, uh, in linear coupling between momentum of the particle and the cavity mode. But now we take all the quadratic terms uh, for the cavities and we diagonalize it, right? Uh, so before uh, cup coupling to the, uh, to the particle, like we already had diagonal form of the phonon Hamiltonian, uh, sorry, of the photon Hamiltonian, but because of the A squared term, of course it's non-diagonal, so we have to do some work, but it's uh, just a simple orthogonal transformation. And then we uh, uh, write, uh, okay, now the actual eigenmodes, uh, uh, well, the actual you know, uh, frequencies of this diagonalized uh, uh, sort of uh, photon part, and you see that it has a mode uh, whose frequency goes up uh, linearly uh, as we increase electron uh, photon uh, interaction. And that's not surprising. It's really just think about it as when we increase Q, right? The A squared term, right? Obviously, sort of corresponds to a large uh, energy contribution to the photon Hamiltonian. And this mode actually is the one which uh, couples to uh, strongest uh, to uh, the uh, particle. And if we take uh, kind of the ratio of this coupling strength uh, to the normalized uh, frequency, it decreases, but from the point of view of the original interaction, right, actually we still find that this coupling uh, for this n equals zero mode actually decreases with g, so it goes as g to the power one half. So therefore, as we crank up interaction, if we just take Hamiltonian as is, uh, it, it is extremely strong coupling uh, from the point of view of uh, light matter interaction. And so things like truncation are dangerous. So uh, the idea that uh, came up uh, from Utah uh, was, uh, again, to use a class of uh, non-Gaussian states which rely on sort of entangling transformations uh, between light and matter. It's 
sort of in the same family as uh, the LLP transformation. And formally, you can think about it. Notice it. This has like a P. It's a, an operator, uh, a displacement. Uh, it's a momentum operator for a particle. And we know that when we apply this operator, we just displace uh, the particle. And now we displace it in a way uh, that depends on the configuration of uh, uh, of electric field, electromagnetic field. So think about it. It's kind of it's a frame which moves with fluctuating electromagnetic field. And so if you do this transformation, you find something quite remarkable. So now the way uh, these transverse uh, fields uh, couple to uh, the particle has been removed from the photon, uh, uh, sorry, for, it's been removed uh, from the momentum term, it appears in the uh, kind of potential energy uh, of uh, the particle. And again, it makes sense, like if our frame is now fluctuating, it's as if our particle now sees a kind of potential which is averaged due to these photon fluctuations. But what is remarkable is that uh, the way uh, coupling now takes place, right? How, uh, uh, if we look at how uh, matter uh, couples uh, in this new uh, kind of decoupled frame, it actually decreases uh, as we go to very strong coupling. So asymptotically, uh, if we go, if we take a light matter interaction to infinity, in this new frame, we actually completely decoupled light and matter excitations. Uh, of course, they are very strongly uh, coupled in the original frame, but it's hidden in this unitary transformation. Is it also involving any truncation? So now this is your choice. So what you can do is, uh, like in this Hamiltonian, uh, you can do the truncation, which is what we have done here. But you can uh, see that uh, actually, if you try, let's say, let's go to this extreme coupling. If we were to do calculation uh, in the original uh, kind of frame, like. Uh, then uh, the number of photons in the ground state would keep growing, right? As we increase light matter interaction strength, whereas now in this asymptotic frame, it actually uh, decreases all the way to zero. And of course, this transformation actually what's good is uh, that it's designed in such a way uh, uh, that for strong coupling, it's actually essentially kind of three for wolf type transformation. And that's why it's also exact for weak coupling. And uh, so you can analytically study weak coupling, strong coupling, for intermediate coupling, this is now where okay, you have to do some either perturbation theory or num numerics with, based on truncation in the number of photons, but it's much less uh, dangerous because we're sort of in the regime where coupling constant never exceeds one, right? Also, the losses are higher, the photons are ignored, right? Or... Uh, so far, we did not include, yes, finite lifetime. Uh, it, it is an interesting question. We uh, haven't thought about it, but I believe there should be a way to generalize this transformation for open systems. But yeah, it's actually a good question. Yeah. Okay, uh, anyway, I, I think so one can, yeah, I mean, we'll, uh, skip the details. Let me just illustrate so uh, some of the uh, things uh, that come out, which are rather uh, amusing. So in, uh, if we think about effective Hamiltonian, basically what uh, we can do now in this new frame sort of uh, analyze uh, this uh, kind of, uh, uh, analyze a particle moving in a new potential, which we said physically can be thought of as now a particle uh, experiencing a potential, which is kind of averaged on the length scale set uh, by how electric field is uh, fluctuating. And if we look uh, at the effective potential, it has a, like we started with a double well potential. And uh, then if we go to this, uh, extremely strong coupling, we go back to essentially very similar potential with, uh, but uh, there is a strong renormalization uh, of the effective potential for at intermediate coupling. So there is sort of, this is where we really get the strongest, uh, kind of the most non-trivial uh, effect of light matter coupling. Uh, this is when coupling constant divided by the photon frequencies of the order of one. And uh, then uh, just to highlight other surprises, uh, we in the strong coupling we also get very large normalization of the mass. And so what this means is that for if we start for light, for small light matter coupling, let's say we had this very uh, large separation of discrete uh, energy levels, right? You can think about this as like uh, lowest energy states, hybridizing the symmetric and anti-symmetric band, and the first excited state would be high up there. But if the mass of the particle gets strongly renormalized, you see that all of these levels uh, start collapsing. And so uh, as a result, uh, these levels, which used to be at very high energy uh, before we introduced strong light matter coupling, 
they sort of go uh, down in frequency and now even within individual wild we uh, have to deal with many uh, uh, matter like excitations and uh, so one of, and as a, a result of this again for this toy model which uh, we discussed uh, let's choose uh, parameters such that the original frequency uh, of uh, the matter was twice uh, the frequency uh, uh, sort of, of photons uh, in this array. So in the array we started, so you see this, it's a finite uh, array, so we have discrete, uh, oh, sorry, a large number of modes at the frequency uh, uh, set by the frequency of individual optical cavities, right? It's finite bandwidth just because of hybridization. And then uh, we also have an excitation uh, that corresponds to excitation uh, of uh, 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 which corresponds to excitation uh, of, uh, of the particle. But now when we start cranking up uh, interaction strength, you see that this excitation, which used to be excitation of matter, actually goes down in frequency, right? And it actually crosses uh, what used to be purely photonic excitation. So we get very uh, interesting uh, bound state in, uh, inside the continuum, but notice in this case, they don't require any fine tuning. They really arise just from the fact that this matter-like excitation strong coupling uh, they become degenerate uh, with uh, uh, light excitation uh, and uh, so and again at, like at very strong coupling then these are the regimes who are essentially in this adiabatically decoupled frame we can do something very simple we can just say oh after we entangled electron uh, the particle and the photons we can just take the ground state of the photon and ask what would be excitations uh, so this is the dash line asymptotically we approach this regime so uh, anyway, I think this uh, kind of shows uh, that we can use uh, these interesting non-perturbative tricks uh, which combine kind of uh, philosophy of both uh, uh, polaronic transformation of condensed matter uh, and using different gauges in optics to analyze uh, the strong coupling uh, QED. Okay, now let me move to uh, the other part of uh, so what, uh, what the cavities can be good for. And this actually, and for me personally, uh, but I think for many people in the community uh, was motivated by experiments without cavities, but uh, on, uh, in this kind of general framework of light-induced uh, states of matter. This is one of the examples. Uh, so it's a buckyball superconductor, which has an equilibrium transition of 20 Kelvin. And uh, let's say if they probe it, the simplest optical probe is uh, to do some kind of reflectivity. And then uh, in the real part of conductivity below TC, you see the gap opening up. It's just like the BCS was a particle gap. And in the imaginary part, there is one over omega tail. But what uh, was observed in Andrea Cavalieri's group is uh, that they take this material and pump it uh, with uh, photons, uh, which uh, have to be resonant with some uh, IR phonons in the material. And then even a temperature which is as high as 100 Kelvin uh, they see something very similar. They see a gap opening up in real part of conductivity and they see one over omega tail in imaginary part. So it's kind of remark. And in this specific material, it's actually uh, remarkably long lived. It lives in nanoseconds. So I would be happy to have a kind of offline discussion about the uh, kind of the physics uh, of these photo induced states. But on the other hand, it is still a finite lifetime. You know that when you pump, material heats up uh, like it. In this case, after a nanosecond, uh, you know, like this transient superconductivity is gone. In other cases, like organic material, so high TC cooperates, it lasts even less, it lasts picoseconds. So uh, this is what motivated many people to uh, search for alternative ways uh, of using light to control many body uh, physics, uh, which avoid this heating problem. And uh, an obvious idea is to use cavities uh, of some kind. And as I know, that's the direction which uh, is also pursued here. Uh, and, uh, but it, of course, is quite remarkable that uh, we are not using classical light, uh, uh, but we're using, we're just controlling electromagnetic vacuum uh, uh, to and, uh, ask whether this can modify the uh, equilibrium state of the electron system. Uh, there are actually interesting uh, experiments which are still a subject of controversy, which see how cavities uh, can affect uh, interesting quantum phenomena. Uh, so uh, there are chemical reactions which are altered by putting them in a cavity. Uh, then uh, uh, Abison's group uh, reported uh, observation of changes in the superconducting TC 
in uh, also in the buckable superconductor and uh, in the cuprate uh, material. Uh, and also reports of uh, ferromagnetism uh, uh, coming from cavity uh, kind of flat, uh, again, presence of cavity like uh, uh, phenomena. But uh, what we want to do is uh, let's look at a very simple uh, example where we can uh, hopefully make more progress. Right? And a uh, specific example that we chose was ferroelectric transition. And uh, it's in this case, it's like the degree, the low energy degree of freedom, the order parameter is most naturally coupled to uh, uh, photons because uh, the transition really occurs uh, when we have, let's say, one of the ions moving away from the equilibrium position, the unit cell develops electric dipolar moment, which couples uh, to electric field in the cavity. And without the cavity, we know that there is a well-defined, uh, uh, that the usual Ginsburg-Landau theory of the phase transition provides fairly accurate description, uh, including the quantum critical points. So another advantage of this transition is that one can either tune through this with temperature or just, let's say, by applying pressure, isotope substitution, so we have a quantum critical point. And so to describe this point, uh, one can use this Ginsburg-Landau theory, but what is crucial in this theory is uh, phonon and linearities. Uh, so if one wants to look at, uh, uh, for example, where does uh, the transition take place, it's not enough, like usual in Landau, what you think about, oh, it's just where this coefficient changes sign A, right? When it's negative, it's energetically favorable to have expectation value of polarization. Actually, that's not uh, really true. What one should look at as a kind of, uh, one should look at renormalization uh, of, uh, of this coefficient A by fluctuations, right? It's really uh, this combined uh, quantity. Or the way this was checked in experiments, let's say they looked at uh, uh, basically things like response function, susceptibility uh, of uh, the paraelectric material. Uh, so how easy it is to polarize it by the electric field. Uh, and when it diverges, we have a transition. And notice uh, that the divergence is, again, not determined by the point where this coefficient A goes to zero, but it's really A plus the contribution due to uh, phonon fluctuations themselves. And so this self-consistent theory actually turns out to give a fairly uh, accurate description of the quantum uh, critical point. Okay, and now what uh, the question that we ask is, uh, how will the physics of paraelectric to ferroelectric transition change once we, play it, uh, we place it in the cavity? And uh, okay, well, uh, so for someone like me coming from uh, Enhancement background, the first thing is to actually recall how cavities uh, work. So, uh, and uh, fortunately, it's a sufficiently simple equation uh, which uh, involves a sort of a magnetic constant and the electric uh, uh, constant. And uh, if we take this canonical uh, uh, examples uh, in which the electric constant is not a function of frequency, then we get equally spaced uh, modes, right? Uh, uh, which correspond to different excitations, uh, different excitations of the cavity. Uh, now let's imagine that uh, we uh, put a paraelectric in the middle. So to find eigenmode, like in zeroth order, we still have to use the same equation, but now our dielectric constant is a strong function of frequency because we know that uh, it actually goes through divergence uh, at the frequency of uh, the phonon resonance. And therefore, in a fairly narrow uh, range of frequencies around this resonance, we can find many solutions to this frequency, which are no longer uh, space, but there will be sort of very kind of dense uh, zoo of modes, uh, which correspond to uh, now this cavity, but with the inner side being a paraelectric. And uh, okay, you can uh, go through this analysis uh, and ask, okay, so uh, do we have any softening? Like if we just take quadratic theory, right? We had some non-interacting, neglected interaction between phonons. Uh, and uh, uh, like by putting cavities, uh, like can we uh, change the transition point? Uh, and the, your first suspicion would be, oh, of course, like maybe it's dipolar charges, right? I have a big piece of metal, I put an electric dipole, I get some kind of like a screening dipole on the other hand, this will give me uh, a, a kind of, uh, positive, control, kind of, uh, it will lower the energy uh, of the system. But then you think about it and say, well, but actually we're looking at softening of long wavelength excitation. So I shouldn't think about 
uh, uh, point-like dipoles. I should really think about kind of long dipole chains, like let's say Q equal to zero, and then you realize that actually interaction between uh, uh, sort of infinite chains of dipoles is actually zero because side by side it's repulsion, but there will be another dipole far away where it's attractive, so it, it will cancel. And in fact, one can show that for purely quadratic theory, neglecting phonon interactions, uh, adding the bound, adding cavities does not change the transition, right? So we really have to include phonon nonlinearities uh, in order to understand what the effect on the transition is going to be. And uh, so effectively, we should think about the photon, uh, the, uh, this sort of normalization of uh, the frequency of phonon polaritons, which arises from nonlinear uh, term uh, for the phonons. And specifically, what uh, uh, we can ask is whether this effective phonon frequency is renormalized next uh, to the cavity. And interestingly, what we find is that uh, the phonon frequency uh, gets higher uh, near the uh, walls of, uh, near the uh, uh, cavity bound, near the edges of the cavities. And it, it sort of, the argument turns out to be surprisingly simple. So when we think about matter interacting with light, we're used uh, to think about how matter screens out electric field. But actually, once you have coupled uh, uh, electric field and matter excitation, can also work the other way around. Electric field can screen out phonon excitation. If you have uh, phonon degree of freedom, uh, then uh, it induces some electric field and it actually, and this induced electric field lowers the energy uh, of those uh, kind of unharmonic terms for phonons. So from this point of view, if we ask about uh, this sort of fluctuation of Q squared uh, when, uh, for phonons, when we couple them to, uh, to uh, electric field, uh, to electromagnetic field, or we don't couple, we find that fluctuations are, uh, bigger when coupling uh, to electromagnetic field is present because this electromagnetic field provides effective screening. But when we think about cavity, we impose a boundary condition that electric field cannot fluctuate, right? It's said to be like tangential component has to be zero at the boundary. Therefore, the screening uh, uh, gets suppressed and therefore we actually uh, pay uh, now a higher penalty cost uh, on phonon fluctuations, which means that the phonon frequency should uh, go up, right? So here it just shows that, yes, near, uh, the surface of the cavity, kind of fluctuation Q squared uh, goes up uh, compared to the bulk. It also shows that this is actually a quantum effect. This is not, so it's, does, it's not present uh, when we have just thermal fluctuation, but it appears when we have quantum fluctuations. Is this not happening in the environment in this case? No, no, in this case, no. It's generic. But what is important is that it's a multi-mode system. So what we have to do is honestly consider all the modes in the cavity. Because you see, when we talk about this Q squared term, we really have to integrate all phonon and polaritons present in the system. So in that sense, then also the mode volume is not gonna play a big role. Because... No, it does. So this, like uh, I'll show you, it, it really depends uh, on the size uh, of the cavity. So if you, uh, so you, for this effect to be visible, you really want a thin cavity. So, okay, so this is what shows, uh, let's say, the uh, like a shift to the cavity frequency for numbers, like roughly on the scale like of STO, of course, like STO has uh, uh, more features such as anisotropy, which we did not uh, take into account, but just to illustrate. And uh, what, so here you can see, for example, so this is a cavity, right? And we are asking uh, renormalization uh, of the frequency of this phonon polaritons uh, as a function of the size of the cavity. And you see that, okay, if it's very thick, then we go to the bulk value. If it uh, becomes very thin, then we can get appreciable renormalization uh, of the order of actually something that uh, should be measurable experimentally. Uh, and, uh, okay, and this also illustrates how it depends on temperature. So you see that at high temperatures, where we said we just have thermal fluctuation, this effect is not pronounced. It really arises uh, due to quantum fluctuations. Okay, so now let me change gears. And uh, so from platform, uh, from phot using photons to get interesting uh, states, uh, uh, either uh, uh, through the hybridization with matter, let me discuss how we can use them uh, to probe interesting mini body states which are present due to, uh, let's say, electrons. And I'll choose a specific example of NV centers. Uh, but actually other defects, I think, uh, can be, uh, uh, in principle, uh, pot potentially interesting in this respect. Uh, again, for uh, 
non exports. Uh, so when we talk about NV minus centers, uh, in principle, this has been a one excitation, but let's say in the magnetic field, and then there is crystal field splitting. We add finite magnetic field to split plus one and minus one. So for uh, practical purposes, we can think about uh, what uh, can we are operating with is just two states of this NV center with uh, uh, magnetic. Uh, number zero and minus one so this is like a two level uh, system and uh, now we can ask well how can we use uh, this two level system to interrogate uh, uh, many body state and the argument is as follows uh, let's say we bring this single spin uh, qubit near the surface of some interesting material like the first step let's assume that this is just a piece of metal uh, then what will happen is uh, that uh, and then we ask uh, will this metal change uh, uh, sort of coherence properties uh, of uh, this uh, spin uh, qubit? So in particular, will it, will it modify sort of transitions from the excited state uh, to the ground state? And of course, for this to occur, we need to have magnetic field fluctuations at the frequency that matches uh, the uh, frequency of this transition. So where uh, do these fluctuations come from? Well, they just come from Johnson noise, right? If I have a uh, Piece of metal, I have fluctuating currents. If I have fluctuating currents by B or Savard law, uh, they will cause magnetic field, and then this is magnetic. This magnetic field uh, will obviously extend to the position uh, of the cube, qubit, and that's uh, more or less the idea that now we can use a relaxation rate both one over T one uh, uh, and one over T two, uh, which would be just magnetic field typically at smaller frequencies uh, in different directions. But uh, what I uh, found like pretty, particularly interesting why, let's say, we, I got uh, excited to think about this new probe is that uh, this doesn't, has not just uh, frequency resolution, it has momentum resolution. Because if you think about what kind of fluctuations appear at the position of the NV center, you realize that if we have very long wavelength fluctuation while the contribution is suppressed by phase space, or if we have very short wavelength contribution, like they will just average out before the signal reaches a spin qubit. So the main contribution is really coming uh, from uh, fluctuations uh, on the scale set uh, by the distance between the uh, NV center and, uh, the, uh, and the sample. Okay, and let me uh, discuss like the simplest case. Uh, it's actually, this follows experiments uh, done uh, at Harvard uh, in the group of Hong Kong Park and Michel Lukin. It was really uh, uh, like a piece of metal. And now what, uh, let's just uh, do this program. We want to compute fluctuations uh, of magnetic field uh, at the position of the uh, NV center. And we can relate this fluctuating magnetic field to current fluctuations inside the sample through this Biosa Barlow. So let us do some uh, simple estimates. So if we think about current current fluctuation, well, that's just Johnson noise. It's proportional to conductivity and temperature. Uh, now let's convert this to magnetic field fluctuation. So B of Savar has one over distance squared. Notice that we need to have twice of this B of Savar for uh, uh, both magnetic field. This gives us one over distance to the fourth. We integrate over the volume, which is sort of obviously of, of the order of uh, cube of uh, this distance uh, to the NV center. So we get, therefore what we expect is that noise goes as one over distance uh, to the sample and it's proportional to sigma and T. But that uh, immediately uh, sort of makes us wonder whether this uh, can hold when uh, distance becomes small because we don't expect divergent noise. And uh, what uh, uh, you actually have to do is uh, consider separately the case uh, when distance between the NV center and material becomes shorter than the mean free path. So in this case, we can no longer use this local relation between let's say current and electric field. So noise fluctuations, uh, current fluctuations uh, acquire a uh, momentum structure. Uh, or like physically, we can say that what should happen if we think about the usual drew the formula, right? We write it in terms of, uh, let's say density of electrons, uh, sort of like characteristic relaxation time is, uh, that instead of relaxation time, kind of time between collisions uh, of uh, electron on the impurities, what should enter is really the time that the impurity sees this uh, electron traveling uh, and this is uh, set by the distance itself. And therefore, this noise uh, will actually saturate instead of, so at longer distances, 
uh, so the above mean free path it goes as one over d, but then for shorter distances it will saturate. And that's exactly what was seen in experiments. So here, even in this uh, kind of simple case uh, of a metal, by uh, looking at the distance dependence of the noise, we can extract an important microscopic characteristic of metal, which is its mean free path. Like if one wants to do this uh, kind of in a more sophisticated level, then uh, one uses the following trick. One says, okay, we're interested in noise uh, reaching position uh, of uh, the envy center, but we can use fluctuation dissipation theorem. So we can, instead of thinking about noise, let us consider response. Let's consider a fluctuating magnetic dipole, which emits electromagnetic waves, which get reflected from the medium. And then we can compute uh, what is magnetic field induced at the position of the envy center. Uh, including reflect, reflection uh, from the material, and it's all encoded in reflection coefficients, and then we will use cotangent to relate response function to fluctuation. So you see that we can entirely write this noise fluctuations in terms of reflectivity with two polarizations. Uh, what, uh, and in metals, usually longitudinal uh, uh, conductivity is, so again, okay, that's somewhat unusual, what we're more, familiar, we're more familiar with is conductivity at zero momentum. That's how optics operates. But here we're looking at conductivity at finite Q. And when we have finite Q, uh, we have to specify, if we think about electric uh, field and current, are, are they parallel to wave vector Q or not? And it makes a big difference because if we have electric field which is parallel to wave vector, we have divergence of electric field, which means charge. So long range Coulomb interaction comes in and strongly suppresses it. That's the other hand, if we have electric field and current perpendicular to wave vector Q, the virgins of electric field is zero, uh, and that's why uh, this conductivity is actually not surprised by long-range Coulomb. So essentially, the sigma parallel uh, is going to dominate. But in principle, by analyzing noise, uh, magnetic field noise in different uh, orientations, one uh, should be able to extract both conductivities, although contribution due to the sigma parallel uh, is generally much weaker. Uh, it actually, no, this, uh, uh, the way uh, this is written, it actually, it really doesn't matter. So, because it's all in terms of reflectivities, right? So, the only thing, this Q is a two-dimensional Q. So, this, uh, whether it's 2D or 3D, just enters into how we compute this reflectivity coefficients. Okay. Uh, and, but this technique also uh, applies uh, to measuring uh, sort of, insulators, specifically magnetic insulators, but now we can think about envy center uh, probing magnetic uh, field fluctuations arising not from orbital current, but just fluctuations of magnetization. So now we can say if there is fluctuation of magnetization, we can relate it to fluctuation of magnetic field, just like the usual magnetic dipoles give rise to magnetic field. And so we can uh, relate uh, then this fluctuating magnetic field to the correlator uh, of uh, uh, of magnetization, so it becomes kind of a measure of spin susceptibility uh, of uh, of the system. Okay, so as I said, let's uh, try. So, like one of the questions that uh, we're interested in is how to use these envy centers to probe superconductors, especially atomically thin 2D superconductors. Let's say in TMD, it's very hard to make contacts. Uh, so when even when people uh, suspect that uh, there is superconductivity, let's say uh, uh, it's not easy to uh, confirm it uh, by just seeing uh, 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 actual charged transport. Uh, also, even in the case of graphene, right, so far uh, we don't have like a smoking and sign signature of what is the symmetry of the order parameter. And that's, uh, I will try to convince you that we can use envy centers to uh, do exactly this type of measurement, which will help us well, establish superconductivity in the first place, but also determine uh, the uh, symmetry of the order parameter. And uh, roughly the idea is as follows, we, okay, we, know, we have an expression for noise in terms of conductivity, but now we uh, know how to compute uh, conductivity uh, uh, in superconductors. And the first case uh, that we can see, they imagine that this is kind of more mean field superconductor. So uh, we don't actually have to worry about this preformed Cooper pair. So like the transition temperature is BCS like. So then uh, most of the noise will actually be coming, uh, say, at uh, finite temperatures, will uh, uh, 
will come due to thermally excited quasi-particles. So uh, then we can uh, compute a real part of conductivity due to thermally excited quasi-particles, and we find that it is proportional to the number of quasi-particles. And in an S-wave superconductor, uh, the number of quasi-particles depends exponentially on temperature, uh, uh, whereas uh, if we have an unconventional superconductor which has nodes uh, in the gap, uh, we have a power law. And uh, then one can also, again, establish uh, that there are different dependencies on the distance between the envy center uh, and uh, the material. Then one can actually do even more accurate studies because in real materials, there are more length scales. It's not just, uh, say, the distance. Like naively, you would say all, all, all that matters is this superconducting coherence length, which is roughly like the size of Cooper pairs and distance to the envy center. But in real materials, uh, there is also uh, mean free path, which tells us how disordered this is. So I'll not go through uh, all of the analysis, but just to point out that, yes, we, one can see uh, like different regimes depending on like, one can make predictions uh, depending on what is the uh, kind of the ratio of, let's say, of the distance of the envy center relative to mean free path, uh, relative to the coherence length. This will all show up in different dependencies of noise uh, uh, on the distance. Uh, and so, therefore, there is more information than just temperature dependence, uh, which by itself would be quite remarkable. Okay, uh, but uh, then uh, this, uh, okay, this was a kind of very BCS-like uh, picture, but we know uh, that uh, we, like when we talk about 2D superconductors, they have often very exotic feature that Cooper pairs are formed at very high temperature. And then the actual TC is determined by the fact that Cooper pairs become coherent. So, and uh, the, therefore, uh, when we talk about TC, there are very few quasi-particles to begin with. However, we still have fluctuating currents, but now these fluctuating currents arise due to these preformed Cooper pairs and vortices. So, can we uh, provide some, uh, can we provide signatures of this fluctuating regime? That's sort of what it goes under the name of Berzinski costly thaulis type physics uh, uh, using spectroscopy. And I'll just give you uh, a gist. Uh, so if we think about uh, current flowing in such a superconductor, so we know that we should uh, separate fluctuations of the phase into very smooth fluctuations, right? Uh, sort of like, which arise from the usual gradient of the superconducting phase. From uh, fluctuations which arise due to vortices. And essentially, uh, like in two dimension, the actual uh, transition that we have as BKT, and this has to do just with proliferation of vortices. And uh, so now what one can show, and what is actually remarkable is that if we think about the uh, currents, so this smooth fluctuation, you see, they actually give us current which is uh, along the direction of wave vectors, they involve gradient of the phase, whereas vortex configuration, they actually give us transverse uh, current, like they give us current which is perpendicular to the wave vector, and therefore when we talk about uh, conductivity, uh, transverse conductivity, which we said is kind of the main signal to magnetic noise, one can actually show that it's directly related to the uh, density, uh, to fluctuations uh, of uh, vortices. And uh, therefore, we can relate a, a correlation function of noise to something that people considered in the past when people think about uh, like this big, uh, BKT transition, so one can formally think about uh, vortices as sort of some kind of a Coulomb gas because of the logarithmic interaction between that. Again, there is some interesting uh, physics uh, behind it because like this BKT physics usually is studied uh, using RG equation. And it turns out that you can see this RG equation by basically probing noise at different uh, distances, again, of the envy center. Because as we said, by probing, uh, uh, noise at different, like when we place the envy center different distances uh, to the superconductor, we're probing fluctuation in different wavelengths. But that's exactly what our G equations for the BKT transition describe. They tell us how fluctuations change as we look at different length scales. So, uh, okay, so this is more or less what comes out. So, what we find is that magnetic noise should peak somewhere uh, above the BKT transition. Uh, in terms of numbers, it actually doesn't look so bad, at least according to experimental friends. Uh, but uh, with whom we discussed, uh, but there are also kind of uh, dramatic parameter variations uh, uh, because uh, it, 
And these variations arise from the fact that actually what enters is also fugacity of vortices. Uh, so basically, how easy is it to thermally generate uh, a vortex? Okay, so now uh, let me, uh, am I completely out of time? Should I? Okay, uh, like five minutes. Okay, yeah, that should be enough. So now let me, uh, then in five minutes, I'm sure I'll uh, just uh, finish uh, the idea of spectroscopy of magnets. Uh, so uh, here, let me sort of change, think about a slightly different uh, modality. Uh, we will think about uh, fluctuations of, uh, like think about the different protocol. Instead of relaxation to an up and down state, think about preparing a superposition of up and down, uh, and then looking how uh, the spin of the envy center processes. But then if there is fluctuating magnetic field, it will sort of alter the rate of precession. And by measuring this uh, kind of now fluctuation in the, uh, uh, sort of transverse orientation uh, of the spin of the NV center, we can tell about now fluctuations along the z-axis, and these fluctuations no longer have to be resonant. Uh, in fact, usually this T2 spectroscopy is used to measure low frequency part uh, of fluctuations. And now let us take something very simple, uh, ferromagnet. So if we place a ferromagnet in magnetic field, uh, then there will be a gap in the spectrum. And let's consider the regime uh, where we want to probe fluctuations and frequency which is smaller than uh, this gap. Therefore, uh, when we think about magnetic fluctuations, uh, they cannot really arise from the fact that we generate a new magnet, but they can arise from uh, the fact that we can reshuffle magnets uh, between uh, sort of thermally excited magnets. And uh, one can go through uh, some kind of simple analysis and say, well, basically show that now, uh, this spin, uh, spin fluctuations more or less can be thought of as density fluctuations uh, of the thermally excited magnets. How would we describe these fluctuations? If we were, let's assume that we have a very good ferromagnet uh, so that uh, uh, there is no, we can neglect collisions with impurities, then we could write simple magnet hydrodynamics, right? This is continuity equation on the number of magnets. Uh, and this is just an equation that we can accelerate magnets if we apply gradient of potential. And so, uh, but now also, uh, if it's a fluid, right, and uh, the main collisions come from magnon magnon interactions, then we know that the friction term is of the viscosity type. So uh, then if we look at the imaginary part of this density density response function, we find that it actually uh, is proportional to magnon viscosity. And therefore it's kind of remarkable that uh, uh, by measuring this one over T2, we're essentially measuring viscosity of magnons. Okay. And what do we expect? So uh, if you remember your basic uh, statistical physics, viscosity uh, should, should be proportional to the density of particles uh, and uh, the mean relaxation time. And what we expect that if we are below Tc, right, uh, low temperatures, the number of magnets uh, should decrease. So our intuition tells us uh, that uh, viscosity coefficients should decrease at low temperatures, which sounds to make sense, right? We should see less uh, contribution of magnets to noise should decrease at low temperatures just because we freeze out all the magnets. But there is something actually quite surprising that was found uh, by Dyson. He found that the mean free path and this relaxation time uh, between uh, magnets diverges uh, at low temperatures, right? And this has to do with very unusual character of magnon magnon collisions. And therefore, uh, okay, I'll. I'll be happy if people ask me so to uh, give more physical arguments uh, but it has to do with the fact that magnets are goldstone modes which do not interact in the long wavelength limit so anyway when the dust settles we find uh, that uh, actually even though the number of uh, magnets decreases with lowering the temperature but the mean free pass diverges faster and what we should expect for the viscosity coefficient is to increase with lowering the temperature Therefore, magnetic noise uh, as we approach zero temperature should go up rather than go down. That's why I think that measurements of uh, T2 uh, uh, for magnets uh, will be quite remarkable and will provide the smoking gun signature of uh, uh, this kind of prediction by Dyson, uh, which is more than 50 years old, uh, about the non-trivial temperature dependence of the mean free path of magnets. Okay, with this, let me conclude. Uh, so I try to give you some example where I think uh, we can uh, uh, bring phonons, uh, sorry, photons into the fold of many body physics from the uh, one hand of making them 
uh, sort of components of interesting many body states and on the other hand by using them as an interesting tool to probe many body states of electrons. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Very interesting indeed. So, uh, questions, folks? Yeah, use the mic, please. It's thank, you, thank you so much for the talk. It was very inspiring. I have a question about the first part of the talk where we discussed the hybridization between the cyclotron excitation and the hyperbolic phonon polaritons. Mm -hmm. So, if we were to do this experimentally and think about the fabrication part of it, how would you envision? the rotationary alignment between the three structures would play a role in, uh, in, in getting those coupling regimes to a more further or more decaying uh, behavior. Uh, okay, well, zero for the question. I'm a theorist, so it's above my pay grade. Uh, but uh, I think for what we are discussing, um, like let's say what we did, we uh, assumed that this is something like a two, uh, we, Assume there is simple quadratic dispersion of electrons. So like something like a bilayer graphene would be a good example. We don't need to rely on any specific uh, moiré. Okay. Uh, but how exactly you... I, my understanding was it's not so hard to just combine graphene and HBN, but I may be wrong. Yeah, that's, since... At least that's what Attach told me. Yeah, since the uh, both are honeycomb structures, even if there is a bit of misalignment in getting them stacked, there would be a possibility that the Moira patterns will kick in and how they would uh, affect the overall behavior of it could be a thing to look at when we do it experimentally. Again, the de details will map. Uh, okay, I, I'll have to think about it. I uh, Obviously, once you, you get a more pattern with uh, some and some more in interesting many major bot states, things will change. But I would say if we are at a kind of high temperature, we do not have any of this many body correlated state, like, but we still can resolve cyclotron frequencies. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think more will be as uh, harmful. Okay, that's a good thing. Because for quantum worlds with the plasmonic structures, the hybridization is already shown. Yes, sir. For, for quantum wells, for example, as an electron gas, this has been already shown um, to hybridize well with the plasmonic structures. So in, in this case, will be phonon polaritons of HPN, so it shouldn't be spoke too, too much different. Yeah, there actually, yeah, there were experiments in Yale which demonstrated yeah. very strong coupling, coupling between. between phonons, yeah, uh, yeah. and phonons in HPN. We have a question online. So uh, maybe you go. Yeah. Okay, you yeah, yes. Hi, Eugene. Thanks very much for your nice talk. I uh, One question I want to ask you is uh, you talk about in the later part of the talk using single MV or single spin qubit to obtain various information. So uh, Just one. Uh, Yong, go ahead. You're asking a question. Yes. Can you hear me? Yong, can you hear me? Using single MV or single spin qubit to obtain various information. So, yes. Hold on, hold on, hold on. I don't know if we're going to be able to pull this off because we're on YouTube. Yes, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, I'm speaking. Can you hear? Yes. Hold on, hold on. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if we'll be able to pull this off. He's going to have to put it in his chat because we're going to get feedback because of the live stream with YouTube. Yeah. Uh, Yes, can you repeat the question, please, Young? Okay, if you can what I'm hear me, I can't just... bring the audio up because I've got a YouTube stream going at the same time. We're getting the feedback from YouTube. So I need to put him in. He'll have okay. to put his question in the chat. Uh, okay. If he puts uh, his question in the chat, we can do it then. Yeah, okay, okay. Uh, yeah, Young. Uh, he's got it. So, uh, Young, you will have to postpone your question until meeting with Eugene. So there are some. Mm -hmm. Or just you could type it. That's, that's another option. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, those online, please type your questions. Then it uh, looks like that's the only option. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, thanks for a great talk, Professor. I have two questions. First about the light-induced uh, superconductivity um, paper. So I was trying to read the first experimental papers, and what I found was they seem to have done a Meissner effect measurement for the sample without light. And 
when they did the light induced measurement, the signature seemed to be the electrical resistivity measurements. So I'm curious how convincing is the evidence that what's being seen with the light on is actually superconducting state and not just zero resistivity. Well, actually suggested to what to give a talk exactly on light induced superconductivity. <laughs> uh, one of the situation, first of all, the situation has changed uh, that they now have many more measurements. Uh, in particular, uh, I, before coming here, I was at a conference uh, and Andrea Cavalieri was talking about the experiments seeing uh, light induced Meissner effect in YBCO. Mm -hmm. And I don't, again, it's because there are different classes of materials. Like in the case of YBCO, frankly, I am not yet convinced that what is happening is really light induced superconducting state because it lives for a picosecond. I believe what those experiments tell us, including this dynamical Meissner, they reveal the fact that there were strong superconducting fluctuations to begin with. Mm -hmm. But in the case of K3C60, where, as I said, you can have, uh, they have observed superconductivity living for, uh, you know, like a thousand times longer, right? For nanoseconds, they can now even do DC transport. Mm -hmm. However, there they have not seen Meissner effect. See. So I think the jury is still out, but I would say K3C60 is more likely to be a uh, real light-induced superconductor. And we have a, kind of few papers where we try to suggest a scenario for that. I would like to see that you're excited about this. That's, that's certainly what we, would be great to see. Yeah, go ahead. Just one other question. So about the um, strontium titanate in the cavity mm -hmm. um, papers. So doped strontium titanate is known to have a superconducting transition. And the modern theory is based on phonon plasmon hybrid modes mediating the Cooper pairing? Uh, it's, again, this is a subject of debate, as you know. Yeah, so yeah. there was this uh, earlier paper by Balatsky, right? Mm -hmm. And company where they said it's uh, IR active phonon, which is exactly the one, it's low energy, which gives rise to ferroelectric transition. It's the one that drives superconductivity. Then Patrick Lee uh, came and said, oh no, by symmetry, this phonon cannot have sufficient coupling to intraband electron electron type process it can only couple you to interband process uh, and then dirk van der marl invented a kind of a model said oh let us integrate out uh, those higher bands uh, and then we will get a very unusual type electron phonon coupling so i, I don't think it's like completely settled story would you expect that in this regime of strong light matter coupling inside the cavity uh, is there some reason to think that the TC would change of doped strontium titanate? Uh, in principle, yes, because I showed you that properties of light uh, excite of matter excitations can be strongly renormalized when they couple to uh, uh, let's say phonon polaritons. Like if we take just intrinsically doped, as though it's uh, it's something to think about. So, uh, yes, yeah, so we, I, I think yes, but we have not done the calculation. Okay. Thank you. Uh, online question. So, uh, Zoom question from Yong Chin uh, mm -hmm. asked Do you have examples of more or unique information you can get that are otherwise difficult to measure by measuring multiple NVs and look at that correlation? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, we're thinking about it, but it, uh, Yes, yeah, so I think the, there is place for interest in correlation spectroscopy with NV centers. Like, let me actually give you even some simple example. Uh, like, imagine that I wanted to measure like a uh, very small Q response function with uh, a single NV. We just said, oh, all you have to do is move uh, NV further away from the sample. But at some point, your signal becomes so weak, you simply cannot measure it. So like the simplest thing you, but whereas if you have two NV centers by doing correlation spectroscopy, you can move them far away from each other, yet keep both of them close to the surface and you will still, uh, so this is how you can measure now, let's say small Q uh, response functions uh, of the material. Um, and then I think that there are even more interesting uh, things uh, to be done. All right, I guess to stay on the really busy schedule of our visitor today. So let's uh, at this point thank him very much for a great presentation.